Welcome to the introductory South Africa screencast. Are we ready? I think we're ready. Your goal for this screencast, and I don't really like this goal because there's more in this screencast than this, but you need to be able to explain how the National Party gained power in South Africa in 1948. Like I said, there's a lot of context in this. Um, it's useful knowledge for the unit but you need to be able to explain how the National Party gained power in South Africa in 1948. As always, you can take notes however you see fit as you move through this screen cast. So this is South Africa, as you can see, there's a hole here and a hole here where there are two countries, Lesotho and Swaziland, respectively, um, and South Africa is located, as you can probably guess, on the southern tip of Africa. That's a beautiful flag. I used to know what all of the colors meant. I'm old. I forgot, but you should look it up because it's totally good. Now, we're going to start with this picture, and you're going to be like, huh? Why is this important? And you'll be able to tell me at the end of the unit why this picture is important. Or you should be able to tell me at the end of the unit why this picture is important. There's your teaser. So about 2,000 years ago, a group of people called the Khoisan arrived in southwestern Africa near Cape Town, which is on the southwest corner of South Africa. And the Khoisan were hunter-gatherers, and they owned some cattle. Now these people were met by the Bantu people, who were members of the Bantu language family, and they left west central Africa and arrived in eastern South Africa uh, about 300 years after the Khoisan people got there. And the ancestors of the Zulu, the Kosa, the Swazi, the Sotho, and the Twana tribes all came as part of this Bantu expansion. And all of these aforementioned five groups now live in South Africa and in the surrounding countries in Southern Africa. But you're like, wait, hold on. Where is this Niger River Delta? Good question. So you can see this circled area right here. That's the, the place that the Bantu people left from and moved all over the various parts of the kind of southern half of Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, and some of them end up in South Africa. So we're going to jump way ahead to Shaka Zulu, um, and Shaka Zulu is pictured on the left. He was the king of one of the tribes of the Zulus, and when another king died, he became king of the entire Zulu people in 1818. And Shaka was a powerful leader because he did some things right. He got religious figures among the Zulu nation on his side. Tribes that he defeated were integrated into his kingdom. He transformed his army and promoted officers based on their ability rather than, oh hey, his dad's famous, so I should put him in the army. However, after 10 years of rule, he was murdered by his half-brother. But there was a very unified South Africa for 10 years under Shaka Zulu. We know that the Bantus and the Khoisans had contact with each other. Um, we know this through rock paintings as well, some similarities in their languages. But they were about to have a whole lot more contact with each other in southern Africa because the Dutch showed up in Cape Town in 1652. And the Dutch came because they wanted to establish a little city where their ships could stop on the way to India. And soon the Dutch were joined by the Germans, and they were joined by the French, and they were all very religious folk. Um, and European settlements expanded outwards from Cape Town, and this included some trading with the Khoisan people in the area. Now, these initial settlers were known as trekboers, which is the Dutch word for wandering farmer. And over, to the, over time, this term became shortened to just boar. Boers also became known as Afrikaners, and this is a really, really important point. Anytime you hear the word boar for the rest of the unit, or the word Afrikaner for the rest of the unit, they're talking about a white, per white person of Dutch descent who lives in South Africa, but the boars and the Afrikaners are the same people. That'll confuse you. Hopefully you wrote it down. Here are a picture of your trek boars, or your wandering farmers. Now, the British and the French and the Dutch all traded possession of Cape Town until the Brits took control of it for good in 1815. Now, why would these countries all want to fight over Cape Town? We need to look at a map to figure that out. All these European countries up here are trying to get over here to India. Now, where's a logical stopping point 
if you if you need to sail around Africa because the Suez Canal isn't built yes you're right right on the southern tip of Africa guess where Cape Town was located yes right on the southern tip of Africa it makes so much sense doesn't it so as more British and more Dutch are arriving there is conflict and a rivalry develops between these more rural farming boards and the urban British and part of this is based on resentment around the better education of the British and the fact that the British controlled the finance and the trade and the manufacturing in South Africa. <clears throat> the Dutch kind of resented this. And this quickly escalated. The British abolished slavery in the Cape Colony, which was where Cape Town was in 1833, and this angered the Boers. They felt that this kind of changed the God-given order of the races. However, just because the British outlawed slavery doesn't mean that they're great people. They had a, a law in 1841 that ensured white supremacy, so they weren't really that much nicer than the Boers. Then, beginning in 1835, groups of Boers set out away from coastal areas, away from the British, into the interior of South Africa. They wanted to get away from the British, the increasing British control over their lives. And as they went inward, they encountered many Zulus and there were some fights between them. So as they leave the coastal areas, they hit into that central part of South Africa. And similar to the Boers and the Zulus fighting, the British and the Zulus fighting, because the, the Brits decide they're going to take over KwaZulu-Natal, one of the provinces, and start sugar plantations. But the British won't work on these sugar plantations, or excuse me, the Zulus won't work on these plantations, so the British decide that they will import people from India and in 1893, a gentleman by the name of Mahatma Gandhi arrives in Durban on the southeastern coast of South Africa. And when he got there in 1893, there were more Indians living in Durban than white, either British or Afrikaner um, people. So as this is going on, the Boers are working hard to get some states going and to have some sem semblance of a government in the interior of South Africa. And the British mainly leave them alone. However things get crazy because of the discovery of diamonds which were discovered in a town called Kimberley in 1869 and this was in a Boer controlled area and no the Brits are not going to leave all the diamonds for the Boers so you get kind of two groups of, of white and of European descent folks living in southern Africa leaving each other alone until diamonds show up and then you get some wars between the Anglos and the Boers. The Boers win the first, the Brits win the second one. However, the second one was kind of caused by the discovery of gold in a town near Johannesburg. So now there are even more precious minerals to get control of. And after this second Anglo-Boer War, with which the British won, the Boers agreed that they would be ruled by the British, and the Union of South Africa was formed in 1909. And only whites had power. So the racial demographics of South Africa in this time period, 67% of South Africa was black, 21% was white, 9% was colored, which was a, a, the name that the South African government gave to mixed people of mixed racial backgrounds in South Africa. The remaining 3% of South Africans were of Indian descent. So the Boers feel threatened because the British control the mining industries and the Boers are mostly still farmers. English and Dutch are established as official language is not the language of the Boers. And the United Party, the party, the Brits, is leading South Africa. So the Boers feel like their way of life is threatened. Now as we move on, more and more kind of overtly racist acts are passed. Um, the Native Land Act was passed in 1913, and it meant that blacks could not own more than 7% of the land. And though this slightly increased over time, it was a law until the 1970s. And regardless of these slight increases, that, would, that meant that two-thirds of the population in South Africa, the black population, was not allowed to own more than 7% of the land in the country that their ancestors had, had lived in their whole lives. So what happens next? Huge taxes on the black and colored populations. There's legal discrimination, high-paying jobs are reserved for whites, blacks can't, <clears throat> excuse me, aren't allowed to join the military and have to have passes in order to move around. 
and the African National Congress was formed in 1923 to fight for the rights of black South Africans. In addition to the fighting going on for black South Africans, the Boers start to get angry at all of the power the British have, and they form the National Party in 1914, and slowly the National Party gains power by playing against the Afrikaner fears, the, the fears that Af Afrikaners had of black Africans. And in 1948, elections were held, and the National Party was pushing apartheid, which you will get a definition of soon, but the, the answer, the, the, the short version of apartheid is its its legal separation of the races and apartheid was being pushed in the 1948 election by the national party the party of the boers and just so you know cry of the beloved country which you're reading english right now was published in 1948 and so after the election in 1948 the national party gains control of south africa and so we have more and more apartheid powers. We have vast protest movements. We've got massacres. We've got the African National Congress. We've got some black South African heroes. Here we've got Nelson Mandela. We've got the black South African black consciousness movement. And that's Steve Biko, the leader of the black consciousness movement. Additionally, by the end of this unit, and in, in, again in addition to all those other things that I just mentioned, you will be able to figure out an explanation of, or an explanation for, this picture right here. So hopefully you got some context for South Africa. You need to be able to explain how the National Party gains power in South Africa in 1948. If you can do that, great. If not, go back and rewatch the end of the screencast. Thanks.